Let, let's let's bring it back to this country now. So you, mm. you're back in the UK. Yeah. You're working with with uh, filmmakers here in the UK. Mm. What are the most common things, especially when I'm thinking about lower budget films? Yeah. What are the common things that you get asked to do? A lot of the time, fights are popular. Um, I think because people think that fights are quite easy to achieve and mm. that um, certainly the more commercially minded low budget filmmakers think that they need to have some action perhaps in their film in order to make it sellable. So fights are often ones that, that get, uh, I get asked to do. Um, but basically I get, uh, with the exception of uh, car chases, I'm not a car chase man, but fights, falls, mm. explosions. Mm. Uh, do you ever get involved at the script stage to, to say, do you know what, there's a smarter way of doing this for, in terms of value for money or...? Absolutely, it depends on, on, on the budget of the film. But right. I mean, I like to be involved at least uh, before the schedule's in place. Mm. If it's a, a short film being self-funded, then it's quite possible they will send me the script and say, well, what do you think? Mm. And then it's time to make changes. Mm. Mm. But if it's a film which is, I don't want to say a proper film, but if it's a film no, with funding, yeah. let's say in the half a million to a million pound budget range, then they might just bring me in when they're officially in pre-production. and. Mm. and then they're paying, which is nice. Yeah. But then it's about sitting down, and often what already has happened, what's gone before, is a line producer has sat down, and based on their experience, they've marked up what they think constitutes stunts in the script. Mm. But then they give it to you, mm. you mark up what you think, and then you sit down, mm. and that's a good starting point. Do you ever have that, that experience where you read a script and the, the filmmaker has sent you the script and said, well, there's these three scenes in the film which are, you know, we want to talk to you about, and you read the script and you go, actually, there's about 40 things. Absolutely. Absolutely. What, what are the typical things that most filmmakers think aren't a problem but actually do really need some stunt coordination or at least health and safety? Often the things that people take for granted are the ones that you're more likely to get hurt on. Um, having somebody running down the street tripping up and falling over on the pavement could be more dangerous if you don't plan it and organize your shoot well than setting somebody on fire because the moment you start talking about setting someone on fire there's a reverence amongst the crew like yes we shouldn't rush this yes this involves preparation mm. and that usually there's specialized crew and money being spent and so on mm. but when it comes time to saying to an actor all right run over there um, trip on the pavement and fall over mm. They kind of, yeah. sometimes, some people just expect that to be done. Yeah. And it would be good to have a professional cast their eyes over yeah. it. Now, for me, as a coordinator, I won't say I must be involved in every aspect of, of this script. If somebody says we can only afford you for five days or we'd like to get somebody else for these days, mm -hmm. that's fine. But I certainly will flag scenes up. And I'll certainly suggest how they could be done more safely. Mm. And it might be as simple as putting a knee pad Mm. on an actor mm. and if the actor's script that says that they're wearing shorts can we have them wear trousers and give them a mm. knee pad maybe I don't need to be there mm. Mm. sometimes the other way is to say how about we don't show it on camera mm. you know which is often mm. I think you talk about that in the book is yeah. sometimes a sound effect will will sell the illusion precisely. sometimes it's actually more dramatic in story terms mm. because a stunt for a stunt's sake can be gratuitous mm. Mm. i know when when we made the runner and i had my first experience with a stunt coordinator i remember terry pulling the script out and saying have you thought about this <laughs> it's on page one mm. or something like that and, and it's you know it said the actress grabs a, a knife uh, from a drawer and mm. he said what knife is she gonna grab is it blunt has it been treated to be blunt are there any other knives in the drawer and I suddenly uh, and it, I just clicked into an entirely different world of like yeah actually there's a whole amount of danger everywhere yeah. especially when it's not your mates and yeah. we're all you know it's it's somebody who's brought in to do it yeah I mean if you have a good experienced crew around you hopefully people from the art department, the practical effects department, will be thinking along the same kind of lines. I mean, the last couple of weeks I've been up at, at Pinewood working on a reasonably modestly budgeted film called Jack Falls, and there was a fight scene they wanted me to handle in that and coordinate, and I looked at the script, and straight away I was in contact with the AD saying, can you tell me that we are going to have blunted versions of these knives, as well as plastic versions, as well as sharp versions for when they're just being held threateningly. So all of a sudden, one prop has become three. Yeah. And as it was, he put me in touch with the uh, production designer, an experienced chap, and he had already 
prepared for that. Right. But um, I suppose it, was, it is part of my job to anticipate those problems because on certain features, if you don't flag them up, you'll get to the set mm. and you'll find that mm. they've only got a sharp knife. Mm. Or it might not even be a danger thing, but if you haven't talked to the wardrobe woman and said, I'm afraid we're going to need two versions of this jacket, one that we can wear pads under, which is slightly bigger, and one which is the normal size, you just run into delays and, mm. and problems on set. Mm. And that kind of leads us quite nicely into the conversation about weapons as well, yeah. you know, handguns, machine guns. They can range from plastic, yes. which, which are made to sound real by, you know, yeah. foley metal handling and yeah. then real gunshot sound effects, all the way through to blank firing. Mm. What, what are the implications of that? I know you're not an armourer, yes. but you certainly are involved. S certainly I like to collaborate with the armourer and I have a healthy respect for them and so far all the armourers I've worked with in the UK have a healthy respect for the stunt people. Um, but things to think about is, is obviously with a blank there's a distance issue. We know that blanks can kill and they're not to be played around with and the armourer will keep an eye on that. But also there's weight issues as well. Often guns are used uh, in action sequences and when they're not being fired an actor or a stunt person could be holding a hollow plastic one or a rubber one. I know if I'm holding a gun and I have to perform a stair fall I'd rather be holding something made of plastic or rubber than a heavy metal gun. So these are things that I will be thinking about when I break down the script and I know the armourer will as well and basically we try to keep the amount of time that an actual firing weapon is, is on set and being used to an absolute minimum. Mm. If you can use, uh, there are airsoft guns, you know, the ones that fire little ball bearings, mm. plastic BB guns. There are ones that run on gas now that you pull the trigger and they have the slide action and they eject what looks like a gun cartridge. So they actually mm. give you the full gun mm. motion on camera. You could add a muscle flash in mm. post and uh, the sound in, in, in post mm. as well. It is a very safe alternative. Right. It is amazing when you watch a film, isn't it? Just when you know what you're looking for, mm. how because you're not in a close-up or you're not really looking at it, or because the illusion is being sold by the actor investing in it, yes. or some foley sound effects of you know gun handling, yes. how, how often it really isn't a gun. And it, it's Absolutely. quite amazing. Absolutely. And also, it's with, with let's say, rookie filmmakers sometimes need a bit of convincing mm. and maybe they don't realize that even if you shoot sync sound for a gunfight sequence the chances are 90 percent of it is going to be re-recorded anyway mm. the sounds of the guns on set don't sound as good as the guns in robocop mm. you know <laughs> so with a bit of convincing and sometimes one of the things i love about digital let's put it this way is if you're shooting on red for example and you've got a nice clear monitor you can say to the director who doesn't quite trust you, does that look like plastic? Does mm. that look like rubber? It's mm. the same with knives. If someone's holding a plastic or rubber knife which couldn't hurt a fly, but they're wavering it around, and because the actor knows he's not going to hurt the other actor, he's got that much more gusto going for it, nobody's going to believe for a second that it's not mm. real and dangerous. And mm. with digital, it's there, mm. you know. Mm. Um, another thing I like about digital is, is for example, shooting on red, you can shoot variable frame rates. And there have been times over here when guys have done fights or even falls. And I've said, how about we shoot this at 23 frames a second instead of 25? And all of a sudden they think, oh, it's going to look sped up and it's going to look ridiculous. And with digital, I can say, how about we do one take? And if you don't like it, we we'll shoot it at 25. Because mm. that, that's a brilliant point. Because, again, I've worked with a lot of people who don't really understand changing frame rates mm. and the implication of, mm. it, of it, what it can be, and, and how powerful slow motion can yes. be if you've got the technology to yeah. do it, which is, is more difficult on digital formats, yeah. but it's, it's possible. And, um, you know, how, you know, that moment can be slowed down in time, or as you said, speed it up, yes. just slightly, yes. imperceptibly. It's making it imperceptible. Yeah. yeah, yeah, interesting. It's one of the tools I like, and that's one where there needs to be a bit of trust, and yeah. I think, like I said, in, in Asia, people sort of hold up the action director as a total filmmaker yeah. where sometimes, not always, but sometimes over here 
the DOP sort of looks out the corner of his eye like, hang on, that's my department. Yeah. You know. And w you know, one of the key mistakes I see a lot of people still making today, Ooh. even it's extraordinary, is people will say, oh, we'll, we'll speed it up a little bit in post-production. It's not the same. And it, it, it doesn't work. It's not the same effect. No, it, absolutely. All. You can't squeeze 23 frames into 25 mm. and vice versa without there being some strange kind of weird look at some I point. I think it's more perceptible to a, an untrained eye yeah. that something's been sped up in post than yeah. if it's been shot at 23 and then played back at 25. Yeah, yeah that's a really great yeah.